And we are back. Here we are again with another Carolina Film Network episode. As you guys can see, we have our our new mugs here, our new our new tumblers, uh, tumblers here, uh, showcasing some of that product placement. Uh, and it's actually for PMG Studios for our, our brand or whatever. Um, and of course, we also are bringing to you today our sponsor for this episode, which is American Pit Fighting Academy. And these are the shirts that we have on right here, and this is why we're here right now at the dojo. We are here at American Pit Fighting Academy, bringing it to you live on this episode. So today's topic um, is about uh, product development. This is not. This is what happens before pre-production. A lot of people don't understand that the pre-production stage is just one of many stages. People look at the main three stages of pre-production, production, production, and post-production. But there are two stages before that, and there are also stages after that. So that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about product, uh, project development. And this question came from... Edward uh, Rockwell. Edward Rockwell. So uh, let's get let's just jump right into it because it's a good bit of material. Yes. So we're and we're actually going to give this to you somewhat chronologically. So you can take notes and um, just just take notes on what we're talking about, and you can actually do this in order. All right. So uh, the first thing would be uh, conceptualizing the idea and or slash topic. So here you are. You think you have a story, or you know you have a story that you want to tell, and you know, you know that you you want to include it in a genre. So it's like I want to do a horror. I want to do a horror film. So uh, doing a horror film now, I got to think about my topic. What do I want the subject matter to be? Do I want to highlight something that can be referenced? Do I want to make up the story completely? Does it want to be a? Do I want it to be a slasher? Do I want it to be you know whatever kind of genre? You have to break it down from the genre and and and, and conceptualize the idea itself and then once you have that idea and you can and you can pick the genre that you want to be a part of then you have to hyper target your audience so based off of that story you have to think about who do i want to be the most influenced by this story who do i want my specific audience to be and in, and in essence what you're doing is you're creating an avatar and i'm going to i'm going to quote so Linda Ann, with this, because she's, she's the one that told me this uh, a long time ago, um, which is creating an avatar. When you hyper-target, you have to create an avatar, um, which is all the, all the habits, all the likes, all the things that they follow on social media or their spending habits, everywhere that they go, everything that they, everything they follow, the things that they Google. You want that, you want that, that specific audience member to, you want to target that very specific audience member and create that target, that, spe- that very specified target. Um, and then we move on to story development. Now, this goes to effective storytelling. You have to understand that there are elements of a, of, of a story to make it an effective story. You don't want to, uh, one of the rules that I like to do in writing, I always tell people is you need to make sure that you close all of your circles. So if you introduce a character, you have you have to think about the backstory of all your characters and you also have to close that circle. So don't just introduce a character and then nothing happens to them and they just show up for no reason. Like they need to they need to that circle needs to be closed. They need to have a cause and effect uh, a who, what, where, when, why kind of answering uh, for that specific character as well as different situations. You don't want to put something in the story that happens that ha- that holds no relevance at all you want to be able to reference the relevance of that of that particular thing that you put in the in the storyline and you want to close that circle so thinking about having your antagonist your protagonist what goal is what goal is your protagonist trying to get to and what's keeping them from getting to that goal what conflicts are they are they coming in contact with in that story and you have, you know, like I say, your cause and effects, answering the who, what, where, when, why. When you think about your scenes, 
And you think about what led up to that scene, what's leading up to that point in the story, what happens during that time in the story, and then as a result, what's going to happen next and how does that lead into the next part of the story. And then thinking about your climax, the buildup, the climax, the plot, everything, your storyline, all of these things go, go into your story development. And that's just elements of effective storytelling. And you can Google um, that in more detail. Just like look up and do your research on um, elements of effective storytelling. Also, Alan Johnson on Facebook and Instagram has like a whole story development breakdown. I think he has oh, like, absolutely. like six episodes. You can check that he's, out. A, he's, a, he's a great, great resource here. He's a professional writer that's here. And I even, even, even though I, I teach uh, writing uh, now uh, and I volunteer uh, to critique people's scripts and stuff like that, even then, I am not perfect. And he knows way more than I do. And even with my scripts that I write, I send to him um, to, for him to do a, a breakdown and get a, be, a better critical eye um, on my script so that I can polish it up and make it better and stuff like that as well. So which brings us to researching, researching for authenticity and legitimacy of the story. This, this is actually my favorite part. Of, of any film, of any project, is the research. Because, for, for instance, um, in, in thinking about um, method acting, as a writer, as a story developer, you have to do the same thing and same habits that, um, that method actors do. You need to include yourself into what, immerse yourself into whatever it is that those characters are. You have to be completely impartial of what you're developing. You have to be able to, to learn what that character, the psychology of that character, the actions that that character takes or, or, or has, and what makes that person, for instance, let's say, and I always use this because this is like the easiest reference, is like a police officer. If you're doing a story on, and you include law enforcement, you need to be at a law enforcement agency of some kind, learning tin codes. You need to learn the lingo. You need to learn how people... We watch tons of movies oh God, where they yeah. use the wrong... Yeah, they use, the, they use the wrong lingo or the way that they hold their firearm is wrong or they, they have multiple firearms and the firearm that they pull uh, first, which would normally not be a primary weapon, is their secondary weapon. It's like a whole bunch of stuff. I'm sure you've seen go. lots of stuff too, Christian. Um, I've seen a variety of things. Um, also, having had a law enforcement background, I can tell you in the way they wear their uniforms, right down to the grooming. As a matter of fact, I, I was watching uh, last night an episode on the uh, ID channel cable, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they had guys, you know, playing cops. And these cops, I mean, their face was all shaggy. Mm -hmm. The uniform was kind of unkempt. And it was like, you know, they need to... They need to take better care of how they portray these characters for legitimacy and so to make the whole story believable because, in essence, it's literally a reenactment. So if you're going to do a reenactment, you might as well do it right. Um, also, if I can loop back to the genre, one of the, one of the things you might want to consider when choosing a genre is depending upon what the genre is. Um, will also determine the cost of putting it together. Because, for instance, Absolutely. if you're if you're putting together a slasher movie, like let's say Jason in space, well, there's going to be a lot of CGI involved, you know, versus yeah. a grindhouse slasher movie where it's just you know a different filter in certain instances when you're filming, a lot of blood and just you know a, a lot of uh, different scenes where you're watching people run from the slasher and fall down. Hooray! <laughs> so girl, it might, girl in the woods yeah the, the, chopped up in the, woods. the girl in the woods <laughs> and you know with regards to conceptualizing you know oftentimes when you're writing a story try to put yourself in that person's shoes once you've understood you understand the psychology behind the whole thing you've done research uh maybe let's say like the the, the joker movie that just came out oh, it is yes. so good and why is it so good because they delve deeply into the issues that not only surround mental illness, but what people who live with that have to deal with outside of that mental illness within their periphery. Oh, I, that hit, that yeah, movie hit that me was... on a personal right? level, like having PTSD so, and then like sitting in front of a therapist. And that, I mean, that line was epic when he was like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're not really listening to me, are you? Like, you don't really 
you're hearing the things that I'm saying, but you're not really listening. And that, 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 that immediately let me know, like whoever did the research mm-hmm. for this film, they really, they really did the research properly. Exactly. And, it, yeah. and they made it such a more powerful film, such more, so much more of a powerful film. Yeah. And listen, don't be greedy. Don't be selfish. And this is what I mean. Sometimes as filmmakers, we get caught up in, I want to convey my idea my perspective, my view of the world, but then you're kind of robbing the audience of the truth because your perspective may not be what's actually going on. It may be your imagination being layered on top of, you know, a certain truth. Mm-hmm. And what Joker did, and I'm going back to this film because right now it's it's, it's still going. It's still in theaters. Um, what Joker did is they, they pretty much spoke truth to reality. Mm-hmm. They spoke truth to reality. Sometimes filmmakers try to speak fantasy to reality or truth to fantasy. But in this case, they spoke truth to reality and threw in the elements of, you know, what we all know uh, from the history of the franchise, the the Joker to be. But we truly got to see him uh, in a way that none of us would have expected. And it's that unexpected element uh, of the film that drew in audiences, that made them feel it on a personal level. Remember, you have to connect through your storytelling. Don't be selfish about it. You have to connect because sometimes filmmakers just make it for themselves. You oh, can't yeah. do that. It's, Once it's, you, yeah. it's pretty easy to see a film, um, whether it's the script or the mm-hmm. film. You can almost, every single time when I read somebody else's script, you can almost tell off the bat that they're writing how they talk or they're writing how they act, like how they are as a person. Exactly. And you can see them in every single one of the characters. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, it's, I mean, unless you're, unless the story is supposed to be tailored to everybody being that way, it's just, I mean, you can just easily see it, you know? Um, but uh, again, that research you got to you got to be impartial to your work. You just have to you have to be able to tell the story um, that you that that you've uh, the story that you want to tell, but you want to tell it the most genuine way you possibly can from multiple different angles, from multiple eyes, from multiple characters, and you have to be impartial with that. Um, again, with the research, like let's say uh, we're working on a we're working on projects right now that you know we're still researching and stuff like that, and I think. With what we're doing, you can use so much of that research uh, to authenticate certain elements of the story. A lot of times with the research, depending on how much you delve into it, um, what doesn't change the story, but gives your story more depth. And you can add to the story. You're like, oh, well, I didn't know this. I can add this in. And that, and that, that leads into the next, the next stage or whatever, which is writing a treatment. So once you have, you've done your research, you know all the all the you have everything authenticated. You have the the story that you want to tell. Now you're writing a treatment. And for those of you that don't know what a treatment is, this is basically what you can shop around and also give to people. That is like a lot. It's like an outline. It's like a detailed mm-hmm. outline that doesn't give too many specifics, but it's a detailed enough outline that sets the tone of the film so that people that see it and read it can tell the tone of the film. They can tell the plot, they can tell the storyline, they can see how well the story flows together and things like that. There might be some key lines or some key, um, yeah, yeah. It's like, or, or like having much. someone, yeah, it's like having, it's like you making a, a dish or a stew that's incredibly delicious with all these ingredients, but you're just having them a taste of that so that when you serve it to them, you're like, oh man, I can't wait to eat the entire stew. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be awesome. It's, it's um, it's uh, sometimes if you're doing a short film, it, it can be. I mean, it can range. A treatment can range from two paragraphs to twenty pages um, with certain feature films and stuff like that. But when you're doing your treatment, all the things that you've researched, you can put those in there. So that, like, let's say when you put your, let's say if I were to give my treatment to a composer, a composer should be able to look at that treatment and tell when they get to this part of the film the tone that it needs to, that they need to pull from like, oh this needs to be uh more a, a comical tone or this needs to be more of a of a dramatic uh, uh, uh tone or this that and the third yeah suspense or this that and the third they can tell by looking at the treatment that 
what's happening in the story and how you're supposed to feel basically at this point in time during the story. Um, but also when you're writing your treatment, when you're writing your treatment and we'll get back to this, um, you have to, like I said, incorporate those, those elements of authenticity from your research and stuff like that. But you don't necessarily have to put like all the character names right. and all the, all the specific mm -hmm. locations. You can generalize yeah. a lot of the information, but, um, so, but after you have your treatment done, um, then you want to go ahead and set your target date for principal photography. Okay, so this lets every this this puts a timestamp on everything. So this this is how you start to uh, think about organization of mm -hmm. your pre production and your production and your post production uh, processes. And again, remember, this is actually all the stuff that we're talking about right now is before pre production. All this is before pre production. This is literally um the project develop this is just developing the project so after you uh, set your target date for principal photography which is the date that you're going to start filming um then you want to go back and you want to develop your business plan your marketing strategy and plan and and your budget you want to have all this in place you have to treat and we've said this before you have to treat each project like it's its own business. And just like its own business, you have to brand that business. Mm -hmm. You have to push that business and the, and the eyes of as many people that you want to include your hyper-targeted audience. All these things that you've already gone through, these are the things that go in your business plan, your licensing, your insurance, your your paperwork, your legitimacy, your everything that you need. Um, you need to get that into your business plan. Also, with your marketing strategy and marketing plan, you have to be able to think about um, <clears throat> you have to be able to think about how are you going to wh wh what market can I touch with this? So now, even beyond your hyper targeted audience, you also have to think about, like I said, the genre itself. You know, think about different different places you can go to market this film. Like if it's a if it's like a, a film that you, that of course with horror. A lot of times you can go to like different cons and stuff like that, like Comic Con, uh, yeah. stuff like that. Like getting, you know, getting a, a marketing strategy where you can create a booth so you can uh, sell future merchandise or get people interested in your film um, uh, to invest or sponsorships. All these things, as well as budgeting, needs to go into your business, into the same business plan. That budget needs to include everybody's pay rate it needs to include all of the things that you are going to have to spend money on and the best way to do that is to have a stipend before base it off of your low numbers base your budget off of low you always want to round down round down with what you have round up with your expenses i'm, I'm saying that again so people understand <laughs> You need when it comes to your expenses, you need to round up. When it comes to what you have, you need to round down because, because it needs to be a healthy balance and you have no idea what uh, extra expenses there's you're gonna have to control. Extra. There's something's always extra yep. is gonna there's gonna be expenses that come up. But in addition to that, you wanna make sure that all of these things, along with your marketing uh, strategy and marketing plan, your business plan, all that, all the sponsorships, all that stuff. Like that's all great, but you need to take your time and budget properly and make yep. sure that everything is all the I's and J's and T's are crossed and dotted and all of that in yep. advance. In if advance. you don't do your budget properly, you'll end up running out of money. Yeah, you'll, you'll run out of production. money and you'll end up owing people like we do. Yeah. And this is a fact. We are not perfect. We're still learning too. Yeah. But at the same time, you got to learn from those mistakes and proper and properly correct them. Okay, so this is just, you know, and this is probably one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of independent filmmakers make is bad budgeting, bad business planning. They don't, mm -hmm. a lot of people, they, they're they so eager to do their project. The, the first thing that they do is they write their script. They got, I got a script. Okay. I need to move on it. It's <laughs> like, okay, just think about the business aspect of things first and take your time because that's the worst thing that a filmmaker, and I say this all the time, that's the mm -hmm. worst thing that a filmmaker can say is like, I had to compromise with quality or I had to compromise with this because we didn't have it in the budget. 
Well, why wasn't it in the budget? Why didn't you take your time until it was in the budget? Yeah, like wait that extra year. Do what you got to do. Like she's worked three jobs. I've worked jobs. He's worked jobs. Like this this stuff comes out of our pocket. But at the end of the day, if you can't afford it, why put yourself in the hole, you know what I'm saying, and make that mistake and then compromise on quality? There's nothing wrong with taking your time. the, The film that we're working on now, we're... We're well, we're in this stage. Yeah, now. we're in this stage now, but, we but won't it's like be filming until the end of next year. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Any anybody familiar with a film called Waterworld? Oh, Talk yeah. about going way over budget, mm-hmm. right? And the thing is, is some of oh you, you don't you, yeah you don't want to see it. Waterworld? Yeah, with Kevin Costner. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, you I see it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. You got to see it, but I wouldn't want to see it anyway, again. <laughs> um, but. I mean, even if, let's say, you go over budget, some of you may have other resources to tap into, but those resources are called loans. And let me tell you something, the deeper you put yourself in debt, the harder it's going to be to continue to move forward. And also what you have to consider is if you go over budget and you're a victim of your own poor planning and you can't pay your people, guess what? Your reputation is going to travel. All right. It's going to travel like a freaking wildfire. So keep in mind that not only is your financial capital going to take a hit, but your your reputation capital is going to take an even bigger hit. And you're not going to you're going to have people who are not going to want to work with you. And if you're genuinely interested and you have genuine passion, and desire for this industry, you got to do things right. You start good and you have to end great. All absolutely, right. That's absolutely. why you follow, um, you know, these uh, these particular steps. And, uh, you know, you, you got to do what you got to do if you need to make that extra money to put it in the budget. You know, we all have done stuff. I've Ooh. done things. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but on a serious note, yeah, you just, you know, you got to keep that in mind. And also, while you're doing all this and once your production's, uh, you know, in, in full swing, don't forget your call sheets. Oh, yeah. Don't so, forget those. Yeah. No, so going back. And so, and that'll, and we'll dip into that in more detail with, uh, with uh, when we talk, you know, when we do get the topic of pre-production and production and stuff like that. So, but there you go with that. So, in that, with that, um, this is again, I have a saying: if it's not in black and white, it does not exist. Period. That's if you're doing just because it's an independent film, does not mean that contracts are excluded. Does not mean that. Even if I don't care if it's a person off the street or your cousin or whatever the case may be, if you do not have them on a contract, they will more than likely, 99.9% of the time, they're not going to give you 100%. They're not going to give, they're going to be late or they're going to be sassy or they're going to make weird demands or whatever the case may be. And 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 it happens all the time. Yep. And all of us who've done it, film know it happens all the time. But if it's in a contract, and I've had to do this maybe once or twice at the most, which is a pull rank on somebody where I go, listen, uh, that's your not in your contract. Says. That's not in your contract where I have to turn around and be like, hey, listen, your contract says you do need to do this. You did sign for it as your contract. And well, they tightened up. I mean, it wasn't a bad situation. It was just that communication, and then it was just it was handled that quick. Like, look, you need to read your contract. But, um, but yeah, you need to make sure that in addition to these contracts, before you even send out anything, everyone needs to sign a non-disclosure agreement or in or NDA. Every single person. I don't care if it's an extra. I don't care if it's a PA. I don't care if it's anybody. I don't care. I don't care if it's an onlooker that's just walking by, and if they get on that set or whatever the case may be, they need to sign an NDA. That's right. Keep your mouth shut. Sign that NDA. You know, that's 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 trade secrets. That's um, that's you know things about the production, all this mm-hmm. other kind of stuff. They need to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Yep. Um, now, keeping that in keeping that in mind, after you after you develop your contracts and your NDAs, then, and only then, not before, but after you do these things, then you do your crew call. Then you do your your um, hiring for your crew, whether it's a crew call uh, or, you know, you handpick people or you look for people or whatever that are professional 
uh, that you want to work with on the production or whatever, then you hire them. But and again, they need to sign a non-disclosure first, and then they need to sign a contract or negotiate a contract and sign that. Um, and then after that, then um, then you go ahead and send the, send those contracts and all that stuff to them. And then after all that's done, after all that's done, you have a part that's uh, that goes back to what I was talking about with the treatment. Because now you have other eyes on, on the treatment. So now that you have other eyes on the treatment, you sit down with your marketing team. You sit down with your with your production managers um, or wh- whoever you have specifically that has a position of insight on how we can monetize the film. Now, mind you, distribution is only a small part of the equation of making of monetizing your film. And we talked about that before. Mm-hmm. This is where that comes in. This is the first stage of where that comes into play. And that is where you look at that treatment, scene for scene, break and break it down. And you look at each scene in that paragraph, and you go, what's happening here? What parts of these, what parts of this scene can we monetize? What parts of this scene can we market? What parts of this scene can we mer- can we do you have Merchandise. merchandising for? Mm-hmm. Uh, what type? What yeah? Sp- what things can we get sponsorship for in this scene? What type of product placement can we do in this scene? You do that for every single paragraph, Actually, breaking that. Night. Yeah, we did it last night. You <laughs> break it down every single paragraph, and you go. This right here is not going to take away the attention of the story. But it is something that we can put product placement in. The cup she's drinking out of can have a logo on it. The shirt that she's wearing can have a logo on it or something like that. Or it can be something that you merchandise. Yeah, exactly. Something that you can merchandise. Like, let's say you create a shirt. Let's say you create a shirt that has a, a line that's in the movie that's kind of subtle. But it's a shirt that's recognizable. That you can merchandise later on, or it could even be a catchphrase. Look, exactly, a catchphrase. You know, it could be something like subtle, or just a catchphrase that just has that—I don't know—that certain quality that make people want to say it. Absolutely. You know, like even Absolutely. in a commercial, y'all remember "Where's the Beef"? Yeah. Oh, hey, Mikey yeah. likes it. There you know, you <laughs> I mean, the moment I say that, you guys already know what I'm talking. Well, some of you, you know, because that's yeah. way back in the day, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But you're right. But you're right. But this is when you evaluate that treatment, you want to incorporate as many local businesses as you possibly can. Uh, that is what's most accessible for you is the local businesses, mm-hmm. and local artisans, all, all of that stuff. Yep. Um, 95 percent of the time they will be more than happy. Yeah, to they'll be. They'll be. Product oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah because they want that mention in the movie. You know, exactly. there's as a matter of fact, some of these places are not even really widely advertised, but the entire neighborhood knows who they are. In fact, there's one such place uh, on, on Monticello that's like a burger place. And let me tell you, their food is awesome <laughs> that everybody in the neighborhood knows. I didn't even know about them until someone that knows about them told me by word of mouth. And, you know, if they think for a sec that that's going to be like some free publicity and it's going to bring them customers and it's going to oh, shed yeah. light on their business, they may even let you film there and provide food for the crew, which there is, a, which, yeah. hey, catering, let me tell you something, that can cost. And if they provide that free food, mm-hmm. go for it. Absolutely. And like, like with those with those local businesses, um, you also want to think, a lot of people are like, well, you know, trying to get a star in my film. Like, yeah, it's great. You do want to try to get somebody who's notable mm-hmm. and has notoriety in the industry into your film if you can afford it or whatever the case may be. But also don't discredit local celebrities as well. Um, you'd be surprised at how many um, local people that are in the media that are already used to pr- uh, film production. They may not do movies or anything like that, but they're already in the media. They already do film production. You can go to a news station and say, Hey, um, I'd like to get this, you know, reach out to the news anchor who's in the community all the time and say, hey, would you like to do a cameo on my film? This, that, and third. Now you got people coming to watch the film that support that person that may not even be, they may not even watch the same genre type movies. 
But just because they support these people and they pretty much follow them on a, on a constant basis, mm-hmm. now you've grown your audience on top of that yep. because you have somebody in there that has notoriety. So just keeping that, keeping that in mind when you're, when you're evaluating your treatment and trying to think about where can I put these people, where can I put these, these, these locations? Because again, locations, they have notoriety too. You know, you can, you can, you can have historical monuments or, or uh, notable buildings and stuff like that. And that can also add notoriety to your film because people can recognize it. Mm-hmm. And I, like, we know people who like, uh, like Tommy and Robbie, I know they went and visited um, the, the house from, um, from, what's the name of that movie? The Christmas okay. Story. Um, Christmas Story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they went to, yeah, like they went to, they went to the, the, you know, they take pictures. People go to Disney World and take pictures of like different sets that have been rebuilt or different sets in general or whatever the case may be. Like, exactly. if you still you know, have historical locations, more than likely they have like a board that, uh, you know, protects that house or that location mm-hmm. and they'll sponsor mm-hmm. or, um, you know, help put the word out about oh, your yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. Because, it, again, it brings more attention of, of the respect that you're giving to these places. I mean, like you're showing respect and paying homage to these, to these notable places and people are, are going to enjoy that. And just the fact that people can go visit these places, take pictures and, and learn about these places through your film, like that adds notoriety to your film as well. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I wanted to add uh, one thing to, to also consider that if a historic place is featured in your film or some place that everybody knows, you know, there's going to be eyes on your film. Other filmmakers are going to be interested perhaps in that location. And the key thing to remember is you want to, especially as independent filmmaker, maker, mapers, listen to me. (laughs) No, Uh, especially as independent filmmakers, you want to reinvest in your own community because it reciprocates because the next time you go to make a film, they're going to remember what you did for them and they're going to want to do for you. And when, you know, people outside of our general um, um, location or, 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 you know, outside of, let's say, South Carolina, see your film, because, of course, we have the ability to distribute it further and beyond. And we'll talk about that at some point later. Um, they're going to see they're going to say, where is that location? Where can I film it? And when you draw other people in, well, guess what? Now that community continues to grow beyond our own borders, which yeah. makes us all more successful because we can't do it alone. Point blank, none of us are an island. We need a community to be able to expand and become stronger, not only on our own two feet, but also, you know, on the shoulders of of, of those that have, you know, uh, achieved the success that we're looking for, that, that yep. major, major, you know, on yep. the shoulder of Titans. So, oh, so. Yeah. Actually, it's always a, a good taste in people's mouths when you film there. Like recently, I had someone uh, a town um, reach out to me that I filmed in before. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. like, hey. If you have any other projects coming up, let us know. We'd like to, you know, it's like for you to use our town. So yeah, it just so good. happens that we do. So we it's are. like, bam, that's one location <laughs> of, with several locations in it. We don't even have to <laughs> try to get now. Sponsorship, <laughs> locations. Absolutely. Not to talk about maybe the potential for some free food. <laughs> oh, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. So this brings this brings us to the last part of this, uh, this uh, project development, which is right before beginning pre-production which is writing the script and adapting it to screenplay and i get this question a lot from people and they're like you know well isn't a script a screenplay Mm -hmm. no it's not okay you have a treatment you have a script which is a you know it's a scripted text with dialogue and and scenes and all this other kind of things but uh, having a screenplay, you know, that's that's different. OK, that is for the screen. Mm-hmm. That's why you have things that uh, scripts that are adapted to stage plays. That is for the stage. That's the simplest way I can put it. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's almost self-explanatory, but you have to understand when you're adapting something to screenplay, you're adapting it to what the camera sees. You're not writing it like a novel. You're not writing it with, you know, a, specifics of how to tell someone how to do their job like camera direction and all this other kind of stuff Which like, happens a lot yeah it does it happens a lot and, and a lot of and one of the main reasons why it happens so much is because 
you know, a lot of times we wear these multiple hats where the person who wrote it, it's their project, they're they're producing it, they're the executive producer, they're directing it, mm-hmm. they're in it, they're starring in it. There's yeah. a, they do so many different yeah, things. Like a Swiss army knife of the production. <laughs> and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. But you just again, you need to understand that when you include other people into your project, you have to trust them to do their job. You have to tell them what their job is, of course, in their contracts, but you have to trust them to do what you ask of them to do uh, properly. And it, and, it, and you'll find it frees up so much more of your time to be able to maintain the quality of your film. Mm-hmm. And your energy. Absolutely. Your energy and your quality of your film will be so much better when you actually have someone doing that specific task. And if you have them uh, looking at that screenplay and they're the DP or they're, they're the script supervisor or whatever mm-hmm. the case may be, like they can actually understand what it is that you're looking for much better. And I know it sounds kind of the opposite because it's like, well, if I had it in more detail, wouldn't they understand it more? Well, not really, because you're giving them direction that's taking away from their artistic ability as well. That yeah. DP knows what they're doing. Yeah, when you micromanage people, you tend to kind of like close them off, you wall them off. And when they feel that way, it's going to show in the mm-hmm. quality of what they deliver. Furthermore, going back to what I was saying about energy, listen, you know, if you're a director or producer or whatever, and your energy is geared towards doing what your job is, you can't be sitting around like, oh, my God, I wonder if Wendell's doing what I asked them. Where's Wendell? Wendell, what are you doing, Wendell? Wendell, I thought I told you. Wendell's going to give you two middle fingers and he's going to be out. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, like like I said, at the end of the day, just. I mean, these are these are things that develop uh, your project. Okay, you have story development itself, but you have project development too. This is what develops the project. This is putting all the pieces, all the players, all the elements, all that together before pre-production, so that when you start casting, when you start, you know, when you have that script finalized and all that stuff Locking done, down location, yeah, you know, all that. Because remember, like I said, when you start production especially when it's a professional production that script that screenplay all that when it gets in the hands of a director and producers and all this other kind of stuff it's going to get changed it, the, the, there's a lot of meaty things that are going to be taken or the or fat that's going to be trimmed out of it mm-hmm. this that and the third and that's something you have to accept especially to all my writers out there who try who are trying to pursue a writing career you have to understand it is not it's your vision it's, it's your initial vision in your story or whatever, but at the same it time, it it's, yeah, it's still going to be portrayed in a way that can captivate the audience to the best of that director's, uh, the, to that director's interpretation. And you have to understand, like I said, this is all done before pre-production. We are doing this mostly right now for these independent filmmakers that are out here. OK, and, 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 and this you have to be professional just because you're an independent filmmaker does not mean that you cannot be professional. That's correct. And as a producer, as a producer, you have to be able to develop that business, because, like I said, each each project is its own business. Yep. And that's what this does. This sets up the business so that it's set up in stone and then you can ask people to come and be a part of that vision. Yep. And they won't have to, you won't have to be trying to figure things out here and there. So like by the time you start your casting, that casting director can say, bam, the script is finalized. All these things are done. All I have to do from here, I got these sides that I want these people to read. I got this casting call that I can put together because I have everything right here. I know the tone. I know everything that I need to know. You got your composer, all the people that you're hiring beyond the regular crew for post-production and all that stuff, they have things to look at. They have tangible stuff to look at that's right there where they can go, bam, I don't have, I can minimize my questions. I can minimize my questions. And like I said, that's and that goes into pre-production. But this, like I said, finalizing and adapting that script to screenplay is the last stage before the first stage. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say before the last stage before the first stage. So again, we just want to thank you guys for tuning in um in this in this episode today about project development. 
Um, continue to send us your questions uh, for uh, future podcasts that you want us to to film and answer and, and describe things for you in detail. Uh, and Faith, you want to leave us out? Um, check us out at Carolina Film Network, npo.org. Um, and hit us up with any questions and uh, follow us on all of our social media. Yes, and follow PMG Film Studios as well, or PMG yes. Studios. One last quick thing. Remember, American Pit Fighting Academy, oh, yes. Yes. right? www.americanpitfighting.com. All right? Yes. Come yeah. check um, us out. Yeah, uh, and for any actors that are looking oh. for... Tac- Go ahead. Tactical cinematic development, baby, is yes. what teaches actors to be legit, to look legit. And you know what? You may even be, come out looking like a John Wick. I'm not even mad. You will. We'll teach you the the, the break falls and stuff like that. And guess what? You're also going to get in shape because we're going to whip you into shape. We're not going to allow you to go out there and look like some fool, like some kind of fool, fool, fool. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so check us out. American Pit Fighting Academy. Uh, you know. Just become a better actor um, under tactical cinematic development. Learn how to do what you need to do. And it's not just fight scenes. Hey, we'll learn. We'll teach you how to use the gat, you know, the rifle, how to how to handle it properly, you know, how to breach properly and all that kind of stuff for film, you know, for action scenes and sequences. This is, you know, a uh, 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 part of what we do uh, along with everything else. So you guys know where we're at. Um, just holler at us, and if you have any questions about anything we've spoken of, hey, boom, post it. Remember to ring that bell, give us a like. Hello. Join the conversation. Join, Join it. Conversation. Join it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it.